If you haven't been here for the last couple of weeks, we're in a series called Wonder. We're talking about this is the most wonderful time of the year, and it's the most wonderful time of the year because of the energy that's around Christmas. Again, with seven kids in the house, my children remind me that Christmas is only two days away, or they've been counting it down. They write me notes. Icon wrote me a note last night. She's like, Dad, I'm just in her broken writing. Dad, I'm really excited about spending Christmas with you. And I pull her close and I go, are you excited about spending Christmas with me or opening your gifts? She goes, I think opening my gifts while you watch me. <laughs> that's what she said. I was like, yeah, that's what I, that's what I kind of thought there. Uh, and so I, it's just uh, this year, time of year is like, it's just the energy. Then the snow, I don't know when you, if you woke up this morning, you're like, woo, the snow just makes it feel all the more wonderful. And so we're in a series talking about, can you take that into the new year that it's not just supposed to be right now. It's supposed to be for all the season. And so we're, we talked about the first week. One of the things that robs us of wonder is, is being discontent. I'm not content with what I want, so I want more. And then we talked about another thing that wonders, or it robs our wonder is the not forgiving other people. That oftentimes we are reminded that this time of year is about God and sinner reconciled, the Christmas carol that has it in that. But it's, it's about God reconciling with us and then us reconciling with other people. And you've probably felt that tension as you've had to go to Christmas parties and that certain somebody's going to be there. You haven't spoken in a while and it's like, well, what should I do? And we talked about, well, Jesus says, listen, I forgave you, so you should forgive them. And we talked about how in most of the stories that uh, when we have to pick a character we're most like, we rarely side with the the villain of the story or side with the the person that is the the person that's hurting we always think we're the the victim in a sense in the story whereas we found one of the stories like oh wait no no Jesus says no you you are the person that has offended you're not the uh, offender or sorry you're the offender not the offended that we have offended other people so why would you not forgive other people today we're going to tell the a version of the Christmas story or part of the Christmas story that you might have never thought of that it gets it's like gets glanced over we're going to tell a little bit of history so if you love history you're going to get some history today uh, but you're you're going to learn a little bit about a character in the story and it's not the wise men that I was sitting and going I identify the most with in the Christmas story and so in, in a second I'm going to use some fruit snacks here to illustrate something uh, about with my children but I want you to think about who is it in the Christmas story you identify the most with in the Christmas story, and I'll give you some of the main characters, okay? And I might help you make your decisions, okay? So you got the wise men. Those are who brought the gifts. You have the shepherds, the common guys out in the work in the field. And then all of a sudden, an angel showed up to them. Then you have Joseph. He doesn't get much airtime at all, but there's Joseph in the story. He's just a guy, but he's there. Maybe you would, you're like, I'm just a guy, and so you identify with him. Then you have Mary. Mary, you know, she was a virgin and gave birth. <laughs> really hard to identify with that, I would think. But maybe you identify with that. And then there's Jesus. Let's just take that right off the board, okay? Maybe we, <laughs> that's our hopes. <laughs> but maybe, maybe we don't identify with that. Maybe, maybe we do. Maybe you were born in a manger. I don't know. I don't know your story. But maybe you were. So maybe that's how you identify. Maybe you feel like you live in a barn. And so you identify with the whole story. You're like, well, that's how I feel. And I don't know. Who do you identify with in the Christmas story? Because I think it's always told as Christmas story. So it sounds like some legend passed down, a made-up story to inspire people. So we, we lose the fact that this is a true event that happened. It's a true event that happened, that it was documented by eyewitnesses. Uh, it was documented by people that, that spoke to people that were there, the main players in the, in, it's not a long, long time ago or in a galaxy far away. This is not a story of made up. It is a, a event that happened that really, if we would grab to it and like stitch ourselves to the story, we would pull the wonder into the new year. But the problem is we Velcro ourselves to the story. And then when we get scared or worried or anxiety comes up, we un-Velcro ourselves from the story of that the King of Kings came and was born in a manger. And we Velcro ourselves to ourselves. So I'll, go, I'll figure this out. I'll do something. And then if we do that, what happens is we lose the wonder. The story I told earlier ago, man, there were conversations at points in the house. Well, you know what? Do we just go get a, a credit card? And well, what do, what do I do? I'm moving myself. I unvelcro from the story of Jesus being the guy that can show up and show off. And I go, I'm going to velcro to myself and I'm going to figure it out. 
I'm just going to figure it out. I'll go do that. But that's me figuring out. If I would just remain there and stitch myself to the story of a true event of Jesus being born in a manger and then his life ending 33 years later at the cross and raising again for you and I, and if we would stitch ourselves to that, it changes everything. We've got to stop Velcroing ourselves to that. And so who do you identify the most with? And I got these fruit snacks in, in my house, and I, I've, I've learned a few things with my children, is that this is like a great uh, uh, currency in my house. They love their fruit snacks. They all, like one of my sisters, like every holiday sends kids their own fruit snacks. Like everybody has their favorite, and it's the same company. They taste the same. They just want them to look different. Like these are Jurassic Park, Park um, dinosaurs guys and so what they do is they all line them up like they break them apart and then what they start to do is trade the gummies they all lay them out okay here's my gummies and they 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 don't just eat their gummies like I get gummies I take the whole thing and just put them all in my mouth and then I suck on them for like a while because it's just tasty and uh, I just that's how I like to roll my kids are like dad you don't even know who you put in your mouth I'm like they all taste fine just put it it's like skittles just put them all in your mouth it's so great taste the rainbow okay so they they spread them out like this and then i'll go okay i have a pterodactyl a red pterodactyl i will trade you one of these for two of your scooby-doos and it's like in my mind i was like how is this worth two scooby-doos in their mind this is way better because it's a it's a dinosaur the, the value system has gone up. And so they're like, one of these for two of you. And so all of a sudden, some poor child in my house has got like one gummy and the rest of them are gone because some child of mine is smart enough to go, one of these for all of yours. And somebody's like, that's a great idea. The value system of the T-Rex is phenomenal. You can have all of my gummies and I'll take that one. And then they're like, and they're okay with it. They don't feel shafted. They don't feel left out. They just like, I got a great deal. And I'm watching from the outside going, what is happening here? This is like awful. This is like bullying at its best. And you step in and, and you're like, what's happening here? Well, you start learning that my older ones are figuring out that if we create a system that works for our benefit, we benefit the most. So legend and epic and icon historic, we call them our four bigs. They are four bigs because they're just the four oldest. There's no, no real, it, it's just no science to it. It's just they're the four bigs. And they are always coming up with a system that tips the scale in their direction against the other ones. The, the three that are just like, life is so good. My sisters and brothers would never want to take advantage of me. They would never want to preserve their life. They wouldn't want to control the outcome. That's not them. They just love me. So when they say a red pterodactyl is worth two, it must be. And then my children, those guys, they walk around. And if they ever do this to your child, I'm sorry. That it's just a product of their environment. If you see them trading gummies and they're like, one Scooby-Doo for two of your, you know, it's like you're going to go, oh, my gosh. We're trying to parent through it, okay? The struggle is real. But this is, their, this is the, the currency in the house. And the older ones always function in, I'm going to preserve me, what I want. I'm going to control the outcome. Because that's what we do naturally. I didn't teach them to do that. I didn't say, okay, legend, today I want to teach you how to preserve your life to keep you happy. And I'm going to teach you how to control the outcome in your life. He naturally does that. And when I watch them with their gummies, I see it play out. And it's almost terrifying because you're like, this is a real thing. When I go back to the owner's manual, the Bible, and we call it the owner's manual because I think sometimes you just hear Bible, you're like, oh, this is a bunch of rules. It's not. It's an owner's manual. God created us. He knows how we best function. So therefore, he gave us an owner's manual to teach us how to best function. But just like any good owner's manual, and you're going to get lots of them tomorrow probably if you've got some crazy toys happening, you're going to look at an owner's manual, Psh, I got this, especially if you're a guy, you're like, nope. And then what happens is you get through the process, you're like, it's not working. Where's the owner's manual again? And then the wife goes, I threw it out with the wrapping paper. I didn't think you needed it. At least that's real life in my house. And she's, she doesn't, she always puts them in the drawer. She's like, I didn't, I just wanted to see what you would do. We like to test each other in our relationship. It's healthy. And, uh, it, it, you know, if it's like, oh, cool, and you re respond nicely and loving, she's like, wow, you did really good. If I'm like, what? Why would you do that? Then she's like, ooh, you need a little bit more Jesus? And I'm like, you want, you need a little bit more coffee? Okay, anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, but but the, 
the, the owner's manual is, is if we would read it beforehand, we wouldn't just have to turn around when life is broken. But that's often what happens in our lives. We come back to something that was to keep us from breaking down, but we turn to it only when we break down. It's like my car. I don't think anything about it until it breaks down. Then I'm like, oh, no, what's wrong? And then I want to know. But before that, I don't care why it runs or how it runs. I'm just like, I press that rectangular pedal and I go. It's good. All right? And breaks down. I'm like, what makes this work? What's the bro- Why is it? And so today, I, uh, there is a person in the story I left out that I identify most with. And I think maybe you might identify with as well. It's King Herod. King Herod is a guy that's part of the, the story. He's like a, a footnote to the story. And he is a guy. Now, like here's some of the history I'm going to give you. The backstory to Herod. Herod was phenomenal at controlling outcome preserving his status. He, was, he, he, he did it to a T. He didn't just do it a little bit. He did it so much that, that history, not just through the Bible, but the history books of, of history records King Herod being a, a wretched man, a man that if he got angry, the city was fearful of what he might do because he was always wanting to preserve, protect, and control. That was his mission in life, was to preserve his life, protect protect what he had, and to control the outcome. That is what defined King Herod in the history books. And so King Herod, he wanted to make history. He wanted to be known for what he did. When you look through the history books, he was was the king of, of a Jewish culture, but yet he wasn't Jewish, which rubbed the Jewish people really wrong because they're like, our king that we're supposed to be served, isn't even Jewish. He built the Jewish temple, a huge, like, huge temple, well done. Like, when you look back at it, it's just like the, the time and the perfection that went in, he built it. He built, he built port cities. He built this political system of his days that was like just state-of-the-art everything. He was just a genius when it came to that stuff. But he also, on the other side, to preserve those things and his credibility, He'd kill you if you just didn't like what you were wearing. And so you have King Herod in this story of Jesus that is just, he's like a footnote in the story, but really he's, he's a big piece of the story that if, if I'm identifying to, it's King, it's King Herod. You know, King Herod actually wasn't even uh, like of, of like royal blood. He was a hired king. When the Roman Empire conquered Judea and Jerusalem and all that, they go, okay, we got to put in a king that will kind of take care of this region for us. And so we're going to hire King Herod. He'll be the king. He's going to manage these people. We're going to give him the title king. He's to do that. Well, what happened after all that set up, that's what kind of rubs the Jewish people wrong because we got a hired king. He's here to manage us. And in him being a hired king, the reason why he built the Jewish temple is to win the rights with the Jewish people. It's his brain thinking, how do I win the people over? I will build the temple that they're longing for. I'm not Jewish, but because this will help me win them politically, I'm going to build this big old temple. So he builds it. You should look up what the, the drawings of it that they think it looked like. It was just tremendous. The Jewish people were in awe of the building. As you read through the owner's manual in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they talk about a story as the disciples are walking with Jesus and they look and point to the temple and they just talk about how immaculate and amazing it is. Because that's where the Jewish people said that's where God resided, was inside the temple. And so it was a big deal. So he knew what he was, King Herod knew what he was doing with the people to win them over. He wasn't just a king going, I'm going to be a hired thug. No, I'm going to win people over. I'm going to become a political figure so that I might be remembered in the history books. Well, as the historians have documented, a big war started. I'm going to give you a couple names. You might remember them. You might not when you think about history. But if you want to write these down and go read about it. But you had Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. These two kings and queens team up to go against Caesar Augustus. And a war begins to break out between these three people, two versus one. And King Herod has to make a decision. Who am I going to side with? Who will I become an ally with? Who do I think is going to win this? Who is going to preserve? Who's going to help me protect? And how can I control the outcome? These are the questions. These are the filters he's asking. And so he teams up with Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. He says, I'm going to fund you. I'm going to give you money. Well, the battle breaks out. Big one-day battle breaks out. 
And King Herod finds himself on the losing side. I mean, with really quick as the battles begin, he recognized, I'm in big trouble here. I've sided with the wrong king. I'm not going to live very long. Because in those days, when people got conquered, you destroyed everything about them. Typically, the kings and queens, were, their lives were taken from them. Those that backed them up and were allies, they were hunted down and conquered. And so here is King Herod going, okay, i got to preserve my life here. What do I need to do? And this is what makes him so crafty in what he did. Is he's, he, he knew he could either sit where he's at and hope that Caesar Augustus forgets about him. And so he retreats and hides, or he, he can sit there and go on the attack. I'm going to go attack him and hope that I would win. But I just watched what he did with two armies, my one. No, nah, it's not going to happen. And so what he does is he travels to Caesar, knocks on the door and goes, hey, uh, uh, I'm King Herod. I, I'm here. I want to talk to Caesar, please. Like, that's totally like, what? Like, why would you do that? He's trying to preserve himself. And he goes in and they let him stand in front of Caesar. And he goes, as the historian writes down, he, he starts talking. He goes, Caesar, I know you know I was on the wrong side, that I sent money and, and military people to fight against you. I made a mistake. But what I hope you learned from me Caesar is my loyalty, maybe to a fault, that I will ride someone down into the ground. I'm not going to leave when they just start losing. I'm loyal to a fault. I promise you, King, or I promise you, Caesar, I will be loyal to you more than that. Three times the amount of loyalty I had from them, I'm going to have to you. Now here, Caesar Augustus has to make a decision. What do I do with this guy? Do I kill him? And just take his land from him? Or do I take a man that is loyal to a fault and leverage it? Because they both have things they want to, right? Conquer and keep doing it. And so Caesar Augustus makes a deal with him and goes, I believe you. I'm going to send you back to be the king in Jerusalem, in Judea. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you more land. For your loyalty, I will reward you. What you're doing, great job. I believe what you're saying. So I'm going to give you more. So King Herod walks out of there, not just keeping what he's had, but getting more. And he comes back to uh, his kingdom. He's, it's bigger. And all of a sudden, we are, as that is the backstory to where we're about to pick up in the Christmas story. I want to read that. And you remember all of these things because, again, his legacy was his number one priority. Controlling the outcome was his life goal. Maybe, maybe one more story for you, really, how much of a tyrant this guy is. He changed his will four times, meaning his will, really, when you're a king, the will is all about who's going to be the next king. He had 10 wives, had heaps of kids, like tons. And what would happen was he would, okay, firstborn son, I'm going to write it in my will, you're going to be the next king. Well, in that year, that kid did something, he's like, nope, oh, you're not the next king, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to make him king. And so he changes his will, kills his own son, and makes another child of his king. He did that four times to his own children. Like, this is the kind of guy we're talking about. He isn't a guy that just is like, oh, you know, I think you're going to do great, but I'll be dead, so I don't care. He's really trying to build his kingdom up so that the historians would talk about how great he was. And so we go to the authors in the Bible who pick up the story where King Herod is in. And this story takes place five miles, around five miles from the palace of King Herod. Five miles from where the king resides. If you have your Bible, you can turn to it. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Matthew was one of the disciples with Jesus. He recorded, he was an eyewitness to what Jesus was doing. And here he begins to tell the story. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod... Magi's from the east came to Jerusalem. Magi's are the wise men, the three wise men. Just to give you some context, they even said it in there. It was like two or three years. You drive around and you see these amazing like uh, um, nativity scenes, right? And you've got like the wise men at it. That's not necessarily 100% accurate. The wise men came when he was within two to three years old, not to the, the stable, 
I'm not running around knocking those things over. It doesn't, I just don't feel like it's like a, a wrestling point on, did Jesus, was he born in a manger? Yes, he was. Were the wise men there? Maybe there were a couple other wise men there. I don't know. Uh, just not the wise men we're talking about here. And so these wise men are going to Jerusalem to check out Jesus. And so it was during King Herod, five miles away, and they asked, the Magi asked when they got to Jerusalem, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw the star when it rose and have come to worship him. When the king Herod heard this, he was disturbed. He was disturbed. And if you can read that last line with me, in all Jerusalem with him. King Herod is learning about the king of kings. There's this little boy running around that is going to jeopardize his kingdom. This really ticked him off. This really amped him up. It grinded him that, wait, there is a little boy running around that people are calling the king of kings. This means one day he would take my kingdom from me. Oh, I don't think so. I'm all about preserving and controlling and protecting. This goes against all of that. I, I no, I'm disturbed. And so was all of Jerusalem with him because Jerusalem has been victimized by King Herod's violence his anger, every time he got mad, someone paid the price. So when they learned that he's disturbed, so are they. Because they're like, this is not good for all of us. King Herod is angry. We're in big, big trouble. Remember, remember the facts I, I told you about the history part of King Herod? Now you know why I'm telling you. So you can get the perspective of what the Jewish people are thinking. They're thinking, oh my gosh, he's killed his own boys. This is, this is not good. And so that's why they're disturbed. No, no, it's just crazy. So you jump back into the story by the author, Matthew chapter 2, verse 4. When he had, oh sorry, so King Herod, when he called all the people's chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law, he called them all together. He's like, okay, listen, I, I got to get all these guys together. We got to learn. Okay, what do you know about this? What do you know about this king of the Jews and the king of kings being born in Bethlehem? Is this true? Like, do you know what they're talking about? Am I getting upset for the right reason or they got me on a wild goose chase? So he got anybody and everybody that knows something about who the king of kings were going to be. And they start saying, I think they're scratching their heads because they're like, you're the king of the, you're like the king of the Jewish empire here. You should know this. Like, they're kind of like scratching their head. And he's like, so do you know anything about this? And he asked them where, where the Messiah would be born. And they're like, oh, you should know this. And then they answer, in Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied for it. This is what the prophet had written. And so they're kind of quoting like the old, they're not kind of, they are quoting the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. They're quoting, saying, listen, it, it, it was said that Bethlehem in the land of Judea are, are, oh, sorry, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is where the prophets had written, and this is what they quote, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. That really amped Herod even more. He's like, hold on. This guy is going to take everything I have away from me. He's, he's not just, it's not just for my, it's for the whole world. So if I end, if I can get a hold of this baby and do something with him, I end this and like I could in, potentially control the world myself instead of this king that they're saying. So the story goes, Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them when the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go, reach careful, or search carefully for the child as soon as you find a report to me so that I may go to and worship him. So he's setting him up. He's like, okay, you go find him, come back to me. Again, if you are the, the wise men in this story, you, you're, at this point you're going, yeah, I'm going to do this because if I don't come back and report to him, he's going to kill me. And so they're fearful of their life because of his past. And so they begin to go into Bethlehem. Again, remember, five miles away from here is where the baby is or, or the toddler Jesus is. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it arose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. This is where they put their treasures that you saw in that video. And when they talk about worshipped him, it isn't worshipped singing songs. This is, the, the, the way that they write this in, in the meaning of it is to, is to present yourself 
physically, mentally, in a mode of full surrender. So they bow down. They submit every, their will at the feet of a toddler. Way different than what King Herod wants to do. The wise men, they, were, they, were, they, were, they get the name Magi and wise men because they're wise. They, they, they're geniuses of their days. And they bow down to a baby. I know a few things about babies. I've had seven of them in my house. Holly knows a lot more about babies than me because she's a woman and they, you, I don't need to give you the details, right? They come from women. Okay, anyways, um, we, babies, man, they, they got no power. They have nothing, right? They, they, can't, they can't put their will on me at all. They are a ball of goo, just skin, right? It's like, you just, you just hold them. Like, newborns to me are just like not exciting. Like, they don't even care about dad. They're like, just give me to mom. Okay, you have nothing for me. It's like, mom has everything for me. She's nice and warm and snuggly. snuggly. Did you know this? Just so Side fact about little babies and moms. Did you know that moms regulate the temperature of babies and dads cook babies? Did you know this? This is very interesting. I, to me, it just, it just makes me in awe of our creator, God, is that the whole idea that moms would regulate their body temperatures go down when they're nursing so they don't cook the baby. Uh, when we had legend, uh, I had him on me just, just Holly was napping and they come in, you know, I don't understand why they come in so much in a hospital, but like every hour they're checking the temperature of the baby and they're checking legend. You're like, oh, he's got a fever. And they're like, uh, who was holding him last? I was like, I was holding him. They're like, oh yeah, uh, you, you can't hold him long as dad because you will cook him. You've got to hold them, at least wrap them in blankets. They can't be skin to skin to a dad because you just cook them. Whereas moms, their body, it's just amazing. Like to me, that is like, that, that's what makes me stand in awe of God who we're talking about today, who sent his son Jesus. It's like, oh man, it's all connected. And so here we have this baby who has no power and no position, but because who the wise men thought he was, they bowed down. So let me ask this question. Who do you think Jesus is? Answer this question in your mind. Who do you think Jesus is? Who do you say who Jesus is? Because the answer to that question should dictate what you do with your life. If you say he is who he says he is and who he is, then your life has got to look a certain direction. If you say that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he died on a cross, rose again, my life is forever changed, then you've got to live a life full of grace and truth. You've got to get angry less. You've got to do work in your life because that's what's required if we say who Jesus is, if we believe he is who he is. But if you say he's not who he is, and then you find yourself identifying with King Herod way more. So the wise men, because who they think and know who Jesus is, they bow down, they surrender everything, true worship to him. Go back five miles and there is King Herod waiting outside for news from the wise men where he is. Where is this baby? Because remember, he told the ma Magi, the wise men, hey, I want to come and worship him. I want to come do what you're doing. Man, the king of kings, I want to be on the right side of this. But here's this man in pain both physically and mentally. Historians have documented that he had a rare kidney disease of that day. It might not be so rare today, but it was a painful disease. It put him in pain all the time. And it was going to inevitably take his life. It wasn't getting any better. So he knew the clock was ticking. He knew he needed to do something to preserve his kingdom. And so here's this man close to his death in pain. And he now is waiting for news so he might be able to preserve his kingdom. He's waiting and he's spending the rest of his life in pain, still trying to preserve, protect, and control. He wasn't going to bow down to the baby. He wanted to identify the baby and take the baby out. See, when I tell the story of King Herod, this is why I identify with King Herod. Oh man, I want to identify with Jesus, I really would. Or I would love to have the faith of Mary. But when I look at the Christmas story, King Herod, you know why? Because King Herod was all about his own kingdom. He didn't surrender his kingdom when he heard about Jesus. He wanted to preserve his kingdom. He wanted to preserve his dreams and his aspirations. He didn't want to go and lay those things at Jesus' feet and say, do something with this. I am yours. 
He didn't want to do any of that. And that's why when I look at the story, that's my biggest wrestle in my mind is that I might be able to stand here and tell you what the right thing to do is. But oftentimes I get off the stage and I wrestle, though I know the right thing to do. I don't always do it. It's like I know when, what is healthy to eat, what not to, healthy to eat. And I find myself oftentimes eating what's not healthy for me, though I know it's not going to do me any good. And I'm going to suffer in the workout the next day. But it's like, but it's so good. Building my own kingdom. See, you might identify with him as well because you oftentimes know what the right and wise thing to do. And if you were to tell somebody in your current position what the wise thing to do is, you would tell them the complete opposite of what you're doing. It's funny how that is. This is that you sit down with your best friend across the table of coffee and you begin to share, oh, uh, no, stay, keep fighting for your marriage. You need to forgive one more time. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. And those are the wise things you tell your, your, your friend across the coffee table. But when it is you, the circumstances are so unique to you and it's so different so that you then twick, trick yourself and go, no, that's not the wisdom for me. I'm going to do what feels right instead of surrendering my kingdom to Jesus going, what is the right thing to do? Because here's King Herod, he's doing what feels right in the moment. The author Matthew begins to uh, shift the story a little bit here. After the wise men had bowed down and worshipped him, having been warned in a, in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country another route. And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So in the middle of the night, they took off. And they went to another country. Meanwhile, Herod catches on that he's been duped by the wise men. They're not coming back. So now he's like, well, how do I find this? It's like, I can't. So King Herod, being disturbed and crazy and out of control, puts a decree out that every child from the ages of three to two, somewhere around there, needs to be killed. And all of a sudden, the temple centurions in the army begin to go into people's homes, asking if you have a child of a certain age and if they're a boy, and they take them and they kill them. That's King Herod. He's preserving his kingdom. And you would sit there going, oh my gosh, that's so, whoa, I can't believe you would do that. Like a king could do that. Here's, here's, the, here's the reality of it. Is that we do things that hurt people all the time to keep preserving our kingdom. We don't share resources. We don't give food to someone that's in need or clothes or things. To, oh, that would hurt my kingdom. It just doesn't look as heinous as that because it's like, whoa, that's really big. Because you know what we do? We're great at looking at today's culture and reality. And then we judge the past based on what we now know. That's not fair to the past. The past is the past. You can't look back there and judge it based on what we now know. It's just like, come on. Like, oh, if they would only wash their hands more in the middle e medieval days, they'd have gotten sick less. Well, they didn't know that. They didn't have microscopes to look at how bacteria spreads and stuff. It's not fair to go, they're such a dirty people. They were doing the best they could in the past. We as a culture have got to stop judging the past and what we now know. And we've got to look at our kingdoms and go, what do I need to surrender in my kingdom? That Jesus might be saying, listen, I want to come in and be the king of your life. I want to come and I want to actually protect your life and preserve your life. So King Herod, he, he angry, really amped. Matthew records it in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. And he gave the orders to kill all boys in Bethlehem that were in the vicinity of two years old and under. Because he never heard from the, the wise men. So King Herod on his deathbed, couldn't find the king. He doesn't even know if he did. He just figured I wiped him out. I exterminated him. So maybe I did, but maybe I didn't. Realizing on his deathbed that, man, I don't think anybody's going to mourn or be sad when I die. And so he, one desperate act of being a tyrant, he gives a decree to his council, says, I want you to round up all the wealthy men and women and families. I want you to put them in the dungeon. Go through the city and get them all. And so they round them all up and they put them in a dungeon. And he says, this is what I want you to do. When I die, when I cease to continue to breathe, I want you to go down in the dungeon and I want you to kill everyone so that there would be mourning in this city when I die. Because I know 
that no one will mourn my death, but I want sadness to be felt the day I die. That was his last decree. This is King Herod. This is what happens if we spend a life preserving, protecting, and controlling the outcome of our life is that we do crazy things. Not maybe this crazy, but crazy in the fact that we just, do, we just are all about us and consuming and we don't care if it hurts other people and who we have to step on to get the promotion and do this and that. But if we would go and say, Jesus, I want to build your kingdom. I'm about your kingdom. What do I need to do? We would begin to live in a life of upside downness where it's the opposite of Western culture and Western culture thinking. We would do it in the upside down saying, okay, your kingdom come, Jesus, and your will be done. Now, I'm so glad there are people that write down history because when King Herod died, his council went and let the people go. They were freed. They didn't kill them. They didn't wipe them out. And then 80 years later, 80 years after this event, okay, in the 80, time, 80 years time period, Jesus came, died on a cross, rose again, gone, 80 years later, a man named John on his deathbed says, okay, I got to record the things I saw when I was with Jesus. I got to get somebody that would just listen to the words I'm going to say. I'm going to dictate to them what I saw, and I want them to write this down because I want people to know what I know and what I saw. And so he begins to tell the story of Jesus and all those things. 80 years later, the temple that King Herod had built destroyed and thrown into the sea, gone. Today, you can still go there and you can see the stones that the Roman Empire came in. I think it was the Roman Empire came in and they tipped it and flipped the stones into the sea. They're still there today. So all of these massive things happen and no one's talking about King Herod anymore. He's just gone. Like he becomes a footnote to the story of the true king. In the time of King Herod, a baby named Jesus was born in a manger. And this king searched that he might kill this baby so that he might be able to preserve his kingdom. And John writes on his deathbed, he outlived everyone. Like the historians told us that John's friends and family's all dead. You know how much pain had to be in his life outliving everybody he knew? He was hunted down and beaten so many times because he wouldn't deny that Jesus died on a cross and rose again. And he writes these words in John chapter 1, trying to really begin his version of the Christmas story. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. He's talking about Jesus. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And John wants to remind us, I've seen a lot of darkness. I've seen a lot of dark things, but the light always wins. If you are in a season of darkness and your kingdom it seems really dark, may you turn to the Christmas story, stick yourself to the story of Jesus and see that the light of the world can break through the darkness. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. As we end this, may I ask a few questions for you. What will your story be when it comes to the story of the light of the world? Will your version of the story be, I fought against that light, I lived in darkness? Or will you share the light to your neighbors, your enemies, your families, those that you don't like, because the story of this child is all grace and mercy? Will we stop Velcroing ourselves to the Christmas story? May we stitch ourselves in the story and say he did that for us, and we at any point can be a King Herod, where it's all about our kingdom. Will you be known for the kingdom of yours or be known of the kingdom that you, or you stitched yourself to? King Herod, the historians talk about the things he built, but they do not stand any longer. We speak of the magi, the wise men, of being true worshipers because they stitched themselves to the true events. You have the same choice. And if you're going to stitch yourself to the events of Jesus, that changes your life forever. 
forever. Now, that process is a lifetime. That's a journey. That's not perfection. One, you make the decision and life just gets easy. No, man, there's been dark moments in my life and I've got to say, oh man, I'm starting to not trust Jesus as much and I come back to Jesus. It's okay. Would you close your eyes?